Hello, this is Sheila Bender, and you're listening to In Conversation, Discussions on Writing and the Writing Life. Today, I am happy to have in the studio with me William Mawinney, Port Lilla resident, poet, and curator of North Wind Reading Series. He earned his English degree from the University of Pittsburgh in 1963, and after that moved to Tucson, Arizona, where he worked various gigs, including proofreader, preparatory schoolmaster, and construction estimator. After 20 years at Raytheon as facilities engineer, technical writer, newsletter editor, and corporate trainer, he and his wife Wanda, an abstract painter, retired to the forest west of Sholo, Arizona. He led monthly poetry circles there at a local library, volunteered as a poet in elementary school classrooms, and offered poetry workshops and readings throughout the Southwest. They were chased from the woods by a wildfire, and they now live in Port Ludlow, where he talks with herons while combing the Olympic Peninsula beaches. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very glad to have you. Usually I'm sitting in the audience listening to your wonderful introductions to the poets who come and read at North Wind or occasionally up there at the podium being introduced by you. So it's lovely to sit down and really be able to talk poetry and talk about a career as a poet. And it's different than other kinds of careers for most of us, including you. So I was wondering if you would tell us how poetry developed in your life. Well, it's more how poetry came to me. I was born in 1939 at the, at the tail end of the Depression, and uh, my dad taught uh, night school to uh, returning uh, World War II vets, so he wasn't at home at night when I was little. And my mother had been a uh, biology and Latin teacher. She had this great love of language, and she would read to me as a little kid. That's how language came to me the music of language and the rhythm of language. And I just remember her reading to me my, like my favorite go-to-bed story, uh, The Little Engine I Could. And I still remember that, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. You know, that, that rhythmic language. Mother Goose Rhymes and Robert Louis Stevenson, Charles Garden of Verses and so forth. That musical language got in under my radar as a little kid. And so that's, that's been with me. That's been with me forever. And when did it pop out as poems of your own? Well, I, uh, as you said in the introduction, I was uh, an English major at the University of Pittsburgh. Poetry came later because poetry in the 1960s, you have to remember, was presented as an intellectual exercise, as where you would pull the wings off the butterfly and, and, and do this serious uh, textual critical analysis of poems. And so I got a degree in that. But I remember, and I forget the year, but it was the last time E.E. E. Cummings did a national tour. And I remember seeing him... And he asked that all the lights go down in the in the audience. So all the lights go down in the auditorium, and he only had this little light at the podium. He was all dressed in black with a with a black turtleneck, and he was this bald head. And to me, one of the most magnificent readers of his own stuff. And that went through me like a live bullet. And I thought, wow, adults actually get to do that. <laughs> wow. What if a much of a witch of a wind gives the truth to summer's lie, and I was gone? And this is when you're an undergraduate. Uh, yeah, yes, when yeah. I was an undergraduate. Yeah, and yet, so there was that that sense of that musicality and, and the embodiment of language and somebody reading it. But I wasn't getting that in English and in literature as it was presented in the '60s. I, I know that shifted and changed, but. Uh, that was that was right. when, it, when the door opened to me. So then, despite the fact that you weren't getting it through your studies, you did enter graduate school in English literature in Arizona. That's what took me to Tucson, Arizona. It was a, a master's degree in uh, in English at, at the U of A, and I took some coursework. And then, uh, just to be frank, I I, I, f I flunked my oral exam, and I remember the. Uh, the professor saying, Mr. Merwinnie, you're going to have to hold your nose and read more source material. <laughs> and I left graduate school the next day, never to return to school, ever. Because something you had really learned in that moment with E.E. E. Cummings, uh, I think, surfaced. Yes, uh, just uh, 
my 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 heart was not there. It, it didn't lie there. Yeah, so, but uh, have you ever written a poem called "You're Gonna Have to Hold Your Nose and Read More Source Material"? No. There's a lot of rhythm in that. But exactly. <laughs> and I bet your source material would be quite different than what he meant. <laughs> but you just gave me an idea. All right. Yeah. We'll expect a poem. Uh, so, this poem I want I want to read. Um, probably I started maybe 30 years ago, at least. And I, at the time, I was a I was a long distance runner. Uh, that's before I went to work at the corporation. Looking back at that time, I, the poems that I wrote about running were the ones where I really located my vitality. It wasn't at the corporation. It was out there under the morning sky in Tucson running. So this is called A Question of Scale. The staircase in a doll's house leads to an attic of comfortable size a space of manageable intimacy for a six-year-old. Any father who cares for a malleable mind hunkers down to eye level when his boy asks wondering questions. Such innocent inquiry shouldn't have to look up into the foreshortened, distorted features of a giant adult because a child is already a full-blown philosopher when asking Where did I come from? Jogging under a winter morning sky, I still wonder that same question, wishing the universe would kneel down so I could hide my face in the stars and run on forever. Thank you, Bill. I want to tell listeners that that comes from your book, Songs in My Begging Bowl. So I know from your bio that when you did retire and move to the woods in the mountains near Tucson, you were teaching poetry and creating a community of poets there. I know you do it here. Was that your first uh, time teaching poetry when you retired, or did you do it before you retired? I could retire from Raytheon in 1999 after 20 years. We decided to build our dream home up in the woods in northern Arizona at the same elevation as, as Flagstaff up near Sholo, up in a beautiful Ponderosa pine forest. And I had told myself for years and years this nice lie that I couldn't possibly write until I had the perfect place to do Uh it, the perfect writing studio, which was just nothing but fear manifesting. Even though you were already writing and already had poems? I was was writing fragments. Oh, I see. But really writing was going to be something else. Yeah, I couldn't really write until I had this perfect place. So as part of the plans of the dream home, I incorporated the perfect studio. So now I'm 60 years old, living in my dream home, with retirement ahead of me. And so I put this magnetic uh, sticker on the refrigerator. It said, Bill, are you waiting for something? So I pulled out all these fragments from over 30 years and honored them by finishing them. And the the first book, uh, Songs in My Begging Bowl, is is part of that. Yes, it's self-published. I didn't have time to send those all to magazines 42 times and get 200 rejection slips and play that game. I just put it out there. But to get the courage to do that, to get the nerve to do that, I, I went to a Southwest Writers Conference in Tucson in 2001. Harvey Stanbro was the, uh, the the visiting poet, and you could have 15 minutes with Harvey. So I, I had my little manuscript, and I, I sat down at this table in, in the hotel lobby with, with Harvey. I gave him the manuscript and uh, sat back nervously, and he began flipping the pages, one, and then another one, and then a third one. I'm sitting there with in a flop sweat, wondering what he's going to say, and I'm getting nervous. And after maybe five or six more pages, he, he stops and he looks at me and says, Bill, you should be teaching here. <laughs> and that was... Such a breakthrough, such an encouragement, you know, such a stroke that someone else saw what, what mm-hmm. I was doing and it was valid. And then Harvey invited me to share a podium with him down in Rudoso, New Mexico, a couple of months later. And so that's my very first reading, standing up in front of an audience. And I got a standing ovation and Harvey didn't. I always silenced myself. I'll just be honest with you, Sheila. I always silenced myself by listening to this critic in my head. It was no good. You, you had you know, in the past. Had it had in yeah. the past, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, what are you trying to do? You know, you're you're a phony. That's no good. After uh, the experience with with Harvey and that reading, 
I stood up in public and read my poems, and no one said, oh, shut up, sit down, you're a phony. <laughs> <laughs> so there in, in Arizona, I started hosting a monthly poetry circle at the local library and just inviting people to either bring a favorite poem or, or something that they've written and make it a safe place for them just to, just to read it and share it. And I underlined the word safe because I never felt safe opening my kimono in public with these things from had my you heart. Done, had you had writing groups when you were writing, or did you truly put the book together and... It was all by, on, on my own. You never had a, a response group. from no. people. Okay, no. uh-uh. so you wanted other people to trust themselves and feel safe to right. read what had, they had. And I had an opportunity to um, be like a poet in residence in, in the local fourth grade. Oh, what great fun. Oh, that was that was wonderful. I learned probably more yeah. than I taught. Well, you really um, came up as a poet in a, I would say, unusually isolated way mm-hmm. since you hadn't shared it. But that love of language was informing you the whole time. And it se- seems to me that you read a lot of poetry. Reading constantly. Yeah. Right. And yes. so you really took in somehow by osmosis what helped construct a really powerful poem. I had that background as, as an English major. Yeah. I was aware of the poetic tradition, yeah. but then I began reading contemporary poets and trying to listen to right. people. One of the know. things I find, I teach a lot too, is that people who are well-read often don't take the lesson from what makes what they read so profoundly moving or vivid and put it in their own writing. I have to say to them, well, the images kind of aren't there. These are abstract words. What happened to the actual sensory information? And they go, oh. And I go, oh, too, because I've seen it happen to myself where I can value and resonate with something in a profound piece of work and completely not do it in my own draft. And I think you're unusual in that you allowed that spigot to be open for you. You sort of hmm. a technical writer by day, proofreader, but in in almost like the E. Cummings, the quiet, the dark, the light, the simple light on his poem. You could do that. You could put the simple light on your poem and take all of the abstraction, all of the intangibles, all of that other stuff that we have to write away. And I think that's remarkable. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're drowning in abstraction in this culture, and uh, that's what I come to poetry for is more of of an, of an apprehension and an appreciation of this uh, astonishing yeah. creation that we live in. You know, and you surround us every need day. it like you need food. I Absolutely. can tell that it's working. Yes. Yeah. So, would you like to read another poem well, for us? I mentioned these uh, fragments and little phrases and things. Uh, I, I would take from my reading. I, oh, I love that line, or oh, I like that phrase, or that resonates with me, you know, like a line from Dylan Thomas or something from Tennyson or wh- whatever, and put them in a commonplace book. Some I would use, maybe even steal a little bit. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. I, I have to get going somehow, get to, get, mm-hmm. get the juices going. And there's this accretion around, around uh, some something that won't let you go, Something that, mm, there's something there for me. So I, I'm going to stick with this and... Trust that it'll take me someplace. So I, I have a, just a short little poem called Alchemy. Slipped into conversations along wide, pebbly beaches, these tattered scraps of small, hesitant words, stacks of smooth syllables, went unnoticed. Until one day, years later, when emptying out the pockets of my old jeans, I find a handful of shimmering sea glass spelling out my true name. Lovely. Thank you. And that's how I do feel about those those fragments. But I I have to stick with them, and I have to trust them, and I have to follow them where they take me. You are tuned to KPTZ 91.9 FM in Port Townsend, Washington. Today, Sheila Bender is talking with Port Ludlow poet and Northwind Reading Series curator, Bill Mawinney. One of the places you've been taken in your retirement and fleeing the fire-burned woods that you lived in um, is here to our peninsula, and you've moved from teaching children that you enjoyed very much as artists in the schools and the safe place that you created in your poetry circle in Tucson to doing some teaching of elders through a program that we have here. Yes. How does that work for you? Do you help them? Well, um, this was probably in 2008 and 2009. 
uh, Northwind uh, got a grant to bring arts to elders in the community. And I was part of that. I was asked to give poetry presentations and and not a workshop either, just a presentation to all the retirement and and senior homes in town. There there were five of them at the time. And I'd go back uh, two times per month. So that was 10 visits. That was very rich for me. Yeah. And I would I would share with them how I came to poetry, as I mentioned, as my mother read to me. And I would do the, my, a couple Mother Goose rhymes and, and uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, and, and they'd say, I remember that. Yeah. And I, I could engage them that way. Now, these are people in their 80s and even 90s, many of them in wheelchairs, you know, sitting there, and I'm wondering if I'm getting across at all. So I'd ask them, what are some of your memories? I said, your memories are precious. Because I, I would hear from some of these people some sad stories. They'd want to be with their grandkids, and they go visit, and, and the grandkids are too busy texting or something and put Grandma in a corner, and she, she feels unheard and unseen, unregarded. That broke my heart. So I said, no, your memories are precious. I said, look, there's probably eight of us in this room, and I'd count up their ages and say, Look at how much life experience is in this room. We have seven or eight centuries of life experience here. And I said, the, the computer industry has hijacked the word memory. Computers do not have memory. They have storage and recall. It's a human heart that has memory. So I'd ask them to write some of them down or, or, just, or just talk about them if they couldn't write. Wonderful stuff. Oh, just, just wonderful stuff. Remember one woman, she had to cut her schooling short in England because of the Blitz in World War Two. She says, I still remember a poem, and she got up and recited to a daffodil by Wordsworth, word for word, and it's still there in her heart 70 years later. Oh, wonderful. The word elder to me is, is very special, It's and I make a big distinction between elderly and elder. An elder, for me, is a person who's still growing and still a learner and still has potential and whose life has a promise within it and a connection to the future. So I don't care if you're 90 or 70 or whatever. There's today and tomorrow, so that's what keeps me picking up a pencil. All right. right. Do you want to read another poem? This time perhaps from your second book, Karen's Along the Road? Karen's Along the Road, yeah. I thought I was getting a career when I was asked to write a wedding poem. (laughs) Getting a career. For for, for a dear friend down in Tucson. (laughs) I said, oh boy, I'm on my way now. This is from my dear friend Ken Willingham. He was always in his late 40s. He was a uh, world-class woodworker, but he's also a recovering perfectionist. And since he would order a new piece of equipment like a saw, it would come fresh from the factory in the box. He would unpack it. He would take it all apart and put it back together again to make it better. <laughs> so that, that's what's in the back of this poem. Plus, he was also an avid motorcycle rider. So I read this at their wedding. It's called Your Vow. Now comes your vow to forsake all others. Your magic spell calling down to earth your piece of divine love and tossing your earthly love like ribbons into the wind, celebrating a joining, a bringing together of friends, a handing out of wine. But this great demanding claim calls you both to wild and lonely trust, because love like yours is always folly, because hearts may leap without studying the owner's manual. Your vow is like a gyroscope, spinning your hearts together to face some forlorn facts that love may not be enough, and love may not last forever, and beauty fades, and marriage unfolds with no warranty. So UPS didn't drop this gyroscope at your door to be disassembled and polished to perfection. You can only speak now, without weighing circumstances, without any data on what might happen, should your mate prove less. So may the momentum of your hearts carry you beyond the face of fear 
And may you live together with eyes open. And may you risk all the way and jump all the way in. And your nights will flame with fire, alone with the gods astride your motorcycle, swooping through long corners of intimacy to perfect laughter. It's the only good ride there is. And the rest of your song will be your singing. Very nice. I bet they appreciated the poem at their wedding. And did it start a long career for you of commissioned poems? Uh, No, but I still remember (laughs) that one well. (laughs) I think that's, for me, when I think about being a poet, I would never, I think, use the word career. I think I would use the word life. My life in poetry, or my life with poetry, my life among poetry. Because that's what I think we do as poets, is we remind people that poetry is in our soul, is in our hearts, is in us. But life as we know it, let's call it quotidian. Quotidian. Quotidian yes. life. Yes. The daily life, the mundane life, makes us feel like it's not there. And yet some of the best poetry comes from those facts. Like you have his motorcycle in there. You have a gyroscope. <laughs> you have mm-hmm. the details that come from the way he lives. And that through those details comes this amazing power to help us see how, the ways in which we can transform yeah, and, into and, the fire. And, and that I can, I can only live my own life, but I'm curious about other lives. But oh, you can I, speak from your own life. This, your life will be your singing. Yes, that is uh, something you have found. So that's, you know, through my reading, I'm always curious what other people are about. What are they smelling and tasting and touching and loving? And uh, so that's why I have a, a whole library full of books at home. Having left graduate school, never looking back. Uh, I've probably got several thousand poetry books. I have to trust that yeah, my own life is worthy of song. And then to host this reading series at Northwind, I acknowledge that in other people, and I want to give them, again, a safe place, uh, a place in the community to give voice, to, you know, to stand up and take a breath and, and use their body and uh, say it out loud. It comes through the air and into the ears of the audience. And it's a palpable feeling, and, and the energy flows back when it's really happening. Mm-hmm. It flows back and forth from the audience to the poet and back and forth. And I'm delighted to do that. Just a lot of fun. I, I know, and you do it diligently, and the series has grown. It has many more readings than it did when you first began. Yeah, I'm doing um, – I started uh, – well, I took it over from Jim Watson Gove and Don Roberts back in 2006, and it was uh, once a month, and I've expanded it to twice, and – even sometimes three times. And now people are emailing me from out of town. Do I have room? And, and so I, I don't have to recruit a lot. I just have to schedule carefully. to. Uh, uh, that's a lot. Uh, yeah, that's a lot. But, <laughs> so uh, I, I, and, you know, Northwind is, is now in their new venue downtown, and, and the readings are in, are in the back room, and it's quite a wonderful space. So you're enjoying the move to there? Very much. Good. And in 2011, the community honored you by electing you Angel of the Arts. Yes. And I suppose a lot of that had to do with your North Wind endeavor. That was with uh, you know, yeah. uh, thanking me for the North Wind. I, I really felt honored about that. I really felt heard and seen and valued, and I couldn't have asked for anything more. So moving up here in 2005, Wanda and I didn't know anybody. We just took a leap off a cliff and grew wings on the way down and, and have met people like you and just this wonderful, uh, wonderful community. So I'd love to give back to you. A happy story. So see what 15 minutes with Harvey (laughs) happened. But, of course, you had already written. (laughs) Harvey just was the conduit, the way out into the community. But, again, you know, because hearing you talk about the rhythm of language early in our conversation has influenced my hearing, I hear rhythm, 15 minutes with Harvey. (laughs) So there's another poem for you to write. I wonder if you can tell us now, uh, do you have the perfect writing studio? Are you able to write with imperfection around um, you? I, I, I don't let perfection get in the way of accomplishment. I, I, I used to. You know, if it wasn't perfect, I wouldn't even touch it. I mean, that's why I, I could resonate so well with my friend Ken and, and write that poem, because I understood that. Uh, no, I, I carry a little little notebook with me and, you know, scratch little things down, overheard conversations at the coffee shop or whatever, or even, you know, like you were being playful there about 15 minutes with Harvey, but some some little fragment will catch me and, and off I go, yeah. That's good, yeah. that's good. So language is always a trigger, especially yes. if you hear the rhythm in it. What would you like to tell 
anyone listening who's interested in poetry or thinks that they can't write poetry or thinks they can't understand poetry, all the bad rap poetry has, how can we undo that? I would tell people who want to write poetry or, or just write in general, trust yourself. Trust what comes up and go your own way. All right. That's- That being said, and I think that that's absolutely important to trust yourself and go your way because that's what we each have our own original voice and we have to learn to get out of the way of that. Do you think people can be taught to write poetry? You can have guidance. You can have models. I get hungry for encouragement, but I have to watch. I don't get trapped in uh, in some of the dynamic personalities that that can come and teach poetry. I, I have to watch that myself. I don't respond well to writing prompts. Like, okay, you got five minutes, do that. I I know that's a typical thing. That doesn't work for me. Well, you're making your own writing prompts by keeping your commonplace book. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Exactly. So I kind of dodged your question because I I don't know. Well, that's an answer. I think you can be be exposed to it and, you know, drench yourself in it, drown it. but, Mm -hmm. But still, it's what is speaking to you. I agree. I also think, like you said, guidance. Guidance given a certain way allows the person writing to open up and to see. It's Guidance is part of that safe place. It is, and also also permission. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think we've hit the high notes of how we can help one another. I want to mention that you do teach at Centrum. You have taught at Centrum I, afternoon I, sessions. So, I, I have in the past, right? yes. And uh-huh. so your writing and teaching career is kind of career, notice I use the word, uh, well, has, has come about. And it's really lovely that you do all this for the community, sharing your love of writing and sharing your poems and allowing other people to share theirs and then providing guidance, or at least a place. And that's a big part of guidance, it's acceptance, permission, the knowledge that, yes, adults can do this. We can stand at a podium, but before we stand there, we can write. Yes. We can spend those quiet moments of our own writing our original voice. Yes, and, and, and enjoying language and enjoying taking words and the kind of the sensuous juice of words and rubbing them together and see what happens. So thank you, and I want to repeat before we end the name of your books. We have Songs in My Begging Bowl and Carnes Along the Road, both by William Mawinney, M-A-W-H-I-N-N-E-Y, and I believe they're available locally and online. Mm-hmm. And I want to encourage you to read more of his poetry. And thank you very, very much for coming. Well, thanks for having me. You have been listening to In Conversation, Discussions on Writing and the Writing Life with Sheila Bender. For more of Sheila's interviews, please go to Sheila's website, www.writingitreal.com slash audio. In Conversation is produced by Sheila Bender and edited by Charlie Fleischman. Production coordinator is Mike Schlexer. Announcer is Kurt Vanderslice.